Welcome back to Cancer in Peace. My name is Sean Stewart, and I'm still here with Peter Scalzo, and he's already locked into, if you're watching this on video, he's locked into his journal over here. He's like thinking about what he's going to say as... What I'm going to read. Oh, what you're going to read. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been going on this long journey of his dark night of the soul, and we're going to pick back up from where we left off in his journal and just talk a little bit about this, you know, how he you know, went through this wall and what it looked like. Mm -hmm. And we were two weeks and a day in, I think when we had talked and I wanted to just to go back and visit a little bit about something that happened. And I'll ask you the question because it shows up in your journal and we didn't get into a lot of depth on this last time, but when you first started this journey, you were in the hospital after this major surgery, mm -hmm. you said no visitors. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, um, we know that this journal is a product of Johnny D, uh, violating that ask of no visitors. You had family there, yeah. um, but uh, he violated that and brought this journal up to you. And then we, in this time period, uh, somewhere I'd like to kind of know the, when you start documenting, uh, visitors coming. And so mm -hmm. that represented a change in you. And I just wanted to mm -hmm. explore that a little bit of, um, when did that change come? Why? And how does it show up in your journal? Yeah, it just um, two and a half weeks after the surgery, I just recorded, had visits from, and just aimed the people, put excellent, good discussions, read my journal to Johnny D. Um, Was he your first outside visitor? Um, yeah. That, that you allowed. Johnny D, Dom, and Nick. Yeah. Did you did you say it was okay, or did you did they just come and say we're coming? No I matter. I can't. I don't know. I didn't record that. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure. And then I left the eighth floor for a private room. I put thank you Jesus. <laughs> the nurses were sad to see me go, but they said I was a strong patient. But I was glad to go for a private room. <laughs> Can you describe in some ways what is your feelings, like how they change towards the other's component on this journey? Like where you, we talked about last time yeah. about the journey I, making you more empathetic. I, and so what was going on inside of you as I, I needed to, that? to reconcile some things with just God and me at first. I had to, mm -hmm. I couldn't invite people into that conversation. That was a conversation with me and God only. That's what was going on, I think, is what you're trying to say. Yes, that's what I felt. I felt like I've got to, I've got to do business right now. I've got to, I, I need to have a discussion with God about what's happening. And I talked about last time that I thought, you know, when you were saying that you had anger that it yes. represented unmet expectations, and yep. you were like, "Yep, that makes sense to you For also." Sure. Yep. And so that was part of the discussion that you feel like you were having with God Absolutely. is these unmet expectations about kind of realigning what was going on. Totally. I'm curious why that is a just you and God interaction. Why do Why do you feel like that's the case? I was so distraught. I didn't want to interact with anyone. I mean, I, I don't know how else to say it. I just, I wanted to isolate. That was part of what I was going through. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it was right. Yeah, it's okay. I'm not. But I was dwelling in isolation. I was um, angry, distraught, despairing. And uh, if someone came in, I had nothing to offer them, and I didn't want them to come in. And part I didn't want to hear platitudes either. There we go. Uh, that's uh, part of the reason why I wanted to explore this because I think there might be not unhealthy, but some healthy thoughts related mm -hmm. to what it looks like when you go through the dark night of the soul. And so much of the time you might hear, don't do this journey alone. So that might be the reason why you said, I'm not saying it was right, but there does seem to be something important about your alone part of this journey. Yeah. And maybe just understanding as you think about your journal and what you've seen, what are those th things? And you said something I thought, might be one of the triggers for that is I didn't want to hear platitudes. Mm -hmm. Well, like my next entry, almost three weeks later, two, two and a half weeks when I started to have visitors was about Job and about his friends. Okay, this is good. So you're- yeah, Should I read that? Yeah, but I just before okay. you do, are you, are you at least insinuating 
that um, Job's friends and, and anybody that, who knows the biblical story recognize that they came and first uh, seemed empathetic with Job. And then within a short amount of time, they had all the answers for Job that why he was the, uh, what brought the problems on him. And they were inaccurate in this story. They, that wasn't the reason why Job was going through suffering. And so is your, you seem to be at least implying So I'm going to ask you to put it in your own words that maybe the need for going alone for a while was to be able to have quiet time with God to, without the noise of opinions and facts. Cause something that sticks out to me is that you had said, um, prior to going into this, that you've been prayed over and people had told you that everything was going to be good on the backside of this. Mm-hmm. And they were wrong mm-hmm. uh, that on the backside of this, their predictions, I'll put them as predictions were inaccurate. Mm-hmm. And that probably had to leave a mark as to mm-hmm. in some manner, what's real when it comes to people. Mm-hmm. For sure. Is there anything else? Is that, is that either resonators or other ways you're thinking about this when you think about Job's friends and, and people well, coming to visit? Yeah, I think that what really struck me was this this desire, and I'll just say in us, or I can just say in me, to want to know what God's doing, to want to have the answer, to want to be the fix-it person this desire Mm -hmm. and in evangelical Christianity comes out as I have a word. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. When you really don't know and you really aren't sure. And the best time Job had with his friends was when they were quiet and silent for seven days, just sat with him, gave him the gift of presence. Mm. Then when they started to speak, they just added to his angst. And in fact, just misery. Yeah. In fact, Job had to give a, an offering, a sacrifice for them in the end, God said. I'm mad at your friends. So I guess if you want to make God mad, you can show up at your friend who's going through pain and suffering and try to fix him, <laughs> him or her. <laughs> well, now, <laughs> that sounds like a message you might want to preach on a Sunday or something like that. But I just <laughs> think that it so struck me for my for this visit and what I went through that I'm super hesitant now when I do hospital visitation or any visitation to have answers. I will, if prompted, read a, a like a psalm, that kind of thing. Or, but I won't speak for God unless. I know emphatically, I'm emphatically sure that God wants me to say something. Mm. I don't, we've talked about this before. I think it's because of that person's uncomfortableness that they need to speak into yeah. this thing. It represents something about them more yeah. than it does about you. Yeah. I want to highlight something, um, and this is maybe for our listeners more than it is, is the reality is you never were alone. Yeah. The truth is, is that you had people around you all mm-hmm. the time, mm-hmm. but it were only people who were really safe mm-hmm. or the medical professionals who weren't there trying to fix your soul. Right. Right. Um, your kids that were there, you talked early on when we did the first episodes on this, that we talked about your son, especially that he never tried to give you effects. Right. This is what you need to do, dad. This is what he literally was just there as a presence Mm -hmm. Um, and he read passages and so forth, but not as a fix, but just as a comfort Mm -hmm. um, to be read to you. My daughter too, that they, she was just a quiet presence. Yeah. Yeah. And that really speaks to me that it wasn't actually that you needed to be perfectly alone is that you needed people who weren't there to fix you. Mm -hmm. And so that you could process and express. And that is speaking something I think that's worth all of us hearing from your journal that even though it felt like aloneness in one sense, what you're really seeking was a place where you weren't being fixed and, and given false information, especially Uh, Mm because the last thing you wanted was false, uh, you know, information spoken over you or (laughs) false hope. Like at that moment is false hope. It's it's worse than, um, the no hope. I think, Mm -hmm. I think in some sense, maybe, I don't know. 
I mean, phrases like God's got this and you're going to be fine, things like that. It's what screams out of my mind is, you know, how do you know? (laughs) I just, you know, (laughs) it's just that God's got this is a really... I mean, Easy I know, because there's a truth there, right? I know God has, yeah, yeah, God, it's like, God yeah. has it. I know that, but it's like, yeah, but that doesn't mean I'm. I still, I'm not going to fall off the cliff. I'm still going to fall off the cliff. <laughs> that's a, well, that's, that's an interesting thing. Is like God's got this sounds so right when yeah. you say it, yeah. Um, but He's got what? Can you can you just elaborate on the this that He has? Yeah. Is it? Uh, he has my life, and uh, yeah. he's allowing me to fall off the cliff. Or is he <laughs> like, what does it mean to say God's got this? And I think yeah. what you and I would both say now, I think, and you can either second this or rephrase me, but it is, I need to be comforted. So I'm going to say something that is a truism, but doesn't really express anything that is true about this situation that's personal to me. Mm-hmm. You know, God's got your death and his hands and <laughs> yeah. it may be imminent or, or, but I need to be comforted myself by saying, well, I can't do anything. So I have to say, God's got this cause I have no ability to fix this. It's, it's almost my own expression. I, mean, I have no ability to fix. I, what screams at me is like 11 disciples, apostles who are martyred. And I'm thinking, what were the what was the early Christian church saying to him? Oh, don't worry, God's got God's, this. God's <laughs> got it. He's going to intervene as they were being crucified, upside down, beheaded, and all that. And I will work all things for good <laughs> yeah. according to His purposes, which is true, though, <laughs> yes. right? That's a great. I love that. Promise. How many times were that was that quoted to yeah. you? <laughs> yeah. Well, but I I love that promise. But and I think I think that there's like there's a time and purpose for everything under the sun and and kind of thing like there is a season to really revel in that verse all things work for good but i think like for instance when job was in the thick of it he didn't need to hear that verse what he needed was what my kids gave me i'm sitting with you silent. sitting in the dirt i yep. love that that concept yeah you wanted somebody to come sit in the dirt with you yeah not with a platitude that we didn't know what it meant. It was, this is painful. I'm actually willing to sit in the pain with you. And I had some rough visits. Scriptures being quoted at me. People just kind of sitting there, staring. So you believe that's what you were uh, not wanting to have to deal with with people was that. Yeah. Yeah. But if you knew that people could sit in the dirt without any need to give platitudes and without some awkward yeah give me an answer peter or something yeah yeah hmm. interesting i just as you explore this journal and the things that are going on inside of you and the yeah. wise knowing those wise because it seems like there's some level of hey we need others to heal and maybe what i just see highlighting coming out of this on your dark night of the soul is that the people that helped you the most in your healing journey were those who came without a fix, who were and their presence was the most important part. And right around this time and later, I record, I just say, Jen brought a meal, Gary brought a meal. <laughs> but I, I felt that it was so helpful that I recorded it. I didn't say much about it, had a nice visit, that kind of thing. But there's something about when you're in devastation to receive a card that someone's thinking about you Hmm. or to receive a meal, especially, you know, Leslie would have meals upon meals stored even. And it was, it was so helpful for us because we had six kids and she had that help um and you know those that i think those are a couple good ways to really yeah almost someone almost since as you're saying it that you feel something a level of warmth as you're saying it like you're 
the thankfulness, something like that, as you're mm-hmm. saying, I just almost sense that in what you're saying is that there's a warm feeling even today, as you think about the people that brought things that were just showing care yeah, and presence. Well, if somebody comes in and I remember thinking, I felt like saying, what do you want me to say? <laughs> How do you want me to respond? Because the visit was that kind of a visit, and it's like, I just I have to say, when I sit here, I think about how response. awkward that I've been in hospital settings, <laughs> uh, the uncomfortableness of, and what I recognize is that I'm unable to deal with my own discomfort. It's not mm. yours. It's yeah. I don't know how to deal with myself in those settings of yeah. the reality of what's going on. It's hard for me to set in. It's not so much, and so it is about me. I'm going up maybe as transactionally, I need to show up to show that I'm a friend or something and I don't know what to say. And I'm this awkward presence as opposed to, so this is helpful to hear also, what is it that can be helpful? Yeah, I mean, for? I think. And um, it's dealing with my own stuff. Yeah, and, quick visits and a prayer is nice. Yeah. Smile. I have a prayer for you. God told me. <laughs> yeah, uh, to and so you. God, you tell him what you told me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being silly. So let yeah. me, um, Let me read this. Go for it. Uh, In the book of Job, we discover that it is all right to cry, to doubt, to fear, to question, to need, and to wrestle with the very essence of our existence. We should be honest with God. He wants this. God doesn't always act in ways that we understand. He always acts in his child's best interest. God wants us to be open and honest with him. Job's friends wanted a reason for his suffering. The most productive time they spent with him was when they were silent for seven days. The issue is trust for me. Will will I really trust the Lord? The Lord questions Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Then God displays his omnipotence and omniscience with examples from his creation, i.e. nature. That is the gist of God's argument. His ways are sometimes not our ways. But he is love. Will I trust him? And then Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. Yeah, this is a um, a period where, and I want to just, it stuck out to me again, and so I have to highlight it just because it stuck out to me, is that you start out with the we, and then you got to the I of what were you actually, where mm-hmm. were you at? You're wrestling with your trust, even though, hmm. and you know, you know, there's, you know, these truths and you're willing to speak them. But when you said, I, you were telling in your journal exactly where you were at mm-hmm. and how you were wrestling with the very truth that you were reading. Mm-hmm. And you felt it important enough to write the truth down because you knew that was part of the journey was to express what truth is. Mm-hmm. And then you felt it important to say where you were at. Because mm-hmm. if you were to read the I statements again, I think that would be an interesting tell as to what it is that you feel right now. Mm-hmm. Is that is that a fair? Yeah, I think. And the, the next one, which was right after it, mm-hmm. um, let me read that one because it really camps on to what this one was getting at. I just put God's word breathes the theme of his sovereignty. I think I was trying to reconcile sovereignty and suffering. Mm -hmm. I'm still like trying to reconcile that. Yeah. Pages of the scriptures declare that he is omnipotent and omniscient. Within that sovereignty, he accounts for and gives space for free will. God also allows Satan and his demons certain freedoms. Colossians tells us that we enjoy reconciliation with Christ, a new citizenship, that we stand before him without a single fault. Did my cancer news take Jesus by surprise? Not at all. It filtered through his hands first. He knows how to give perfect gifts. This does not seem like a perfect gift to me. Cancer represents a loss to me. I have grieved that loss of health change in my body, altered relationships, and potential loss of life. Grief usually invokes anger, sadness, denial, and bargaining. 
I have met Christians that denied they have cancer after a diagnosis, almost as if they are given they are giving cancer reality by saying it. The bottom line is that cancer is a part of my reality. But God can heal or and or do amazing things in and through my diagnosis. My reaction has been sadness. At first I was devastated and sad. I believe grief represents normal human e- emotions that God wants us to express. These Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. However, as we have trials and tribulations, God also tells us to consider it joy. The trial or tribulation will produce endurance, perseverance, and proven character. James 1 tells us that when endurance is fully developed, we will be complete. Scripture also tells us that we share in the actual glory of Christ when we suffer. In fact, Jesus himself learned obedience through what he suffered. Please, Lord, help me to have this mindset in the future. Through any pain and suffering that comes my way, you will work it out. I trust in you. So in the in the one journal in the past, before you got to that, you said you were, in your I statement, I wrestling, you're, you're wrestling with trust. I need, you need help in trust. And then you yeah. state in this one, I trust in you. Mm-hmm. At the end of this, I just find it absolutely fascinating that your journal now at this point in the journey is so steeped in the great questions of life. Mm. And then you put it into terms of the cancer has really just brought, because you, you asked this question, I'm just thinking about this question uh, as you asked it in the journal. And the question was something along the lines of you give perfect gifts, but is cancer didn't that feel, gift. Yeah. It didn't feel like that to me. <laughs> yeah. As you look at it now, how would you describe this question and where, where are you at on that? Yeah. I mean, I've, through my journey in this, I've come to the conclusion myself that you know, cancer represents a harm in my life and that God didn't cause that harm, but he allowed it to happen. In other words, it filtered through his hands first. But answer your question. Which which is? Is cancer that perfect gift? Oh. It, it has produced an incredible game changer for me in my intimacy with God. It's produced and just my whole life has changed because of this cancer journey. Ooh, I want I want to just pause there for a second cuz I love yeah. the way you answered this question. Um, yeah. cuz I I thought maybe you might go to well it's produced endurance or a characteristic in you and by itself it'd be hard for me to get to that that represents a perfect gift but there's only one perfect gift and that is God himself. Mm. And what you just described was cancer led you to the perfect gift. It, mm-hmm. The cancer itself wasn't the gift. You, no. you, you didn't miss the point right. in a sense of that. What you would, you just said to me now is that it led you to the perfect gift, your intimacy with God. And it wasn't that cancer itself was the gift because you could never get there. Right. It's like cancer itself is not a perfect gift. It's highly imperfect in its very nature. It represents cells that aren't, that aren't perfect, but it led you to the perfect gift. Isn't that interesting? You were asking that question in your journal and it's a bit of a confused question because certainly it's not, but it's the right question is, Hey, how do I reconcile an imperfect world uh, with where I'm at today is what I think I hear you asking. And, and today you've really got a, a nice handle on the purpose of it. Do you think, like when you wrote that last, I choose to trust in you, um, was that a choice of the will or is that where you've been led to now already in that part of your journey in the dark night that you got to some level of understanding that cancer was the journey to the gift, not the gift itself? Yeah. That cancer was 
a means to get to the gift itself. I think that that everything else had been stripped away, and I understood that. The medical solutions, everything had been stripped away. There was no solution. Mm-hmm. And, in fact, high, there was a high probability that I was just going to pass. Mm-hmm. So do I know you, Jesus, well enough? to place my soul, my spirit, body, everything in your hands. Can I trust you? That's been the journey of my life, I think. <laughs> yeah, but in the, in all of a sudden, the dark night of the soul condensed that. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm really fascinated yeah, by definitely. is that it condensed it and, and it clarified it. Yeah. And you talk about others because you were, Back in that the we there are the we's out there that they yeah. go a different way um, or yeah. the they's I guess that they go the other way and and yours condensed you to hey cancer had led me to the perfect gift in a way that um, yeah and that perfect gift is a greater intimacy with Jesus I mean I think that. It's about the relationship that really mattered to me. Well, this is going to be the hard question, though, Mm -hmm. and that is, was it worth it? And what (laughs) I mean, because you didn't describe, because you had the gift already, right? Didn't you have the perfect gift in what way you got? You're describing what the cancer journey brought Mm -hmm. was you traded less intimacy, Mm -hmm. no cancer, for cancer, more intimacy. If I'm reading what you're mm-hmm. saying or understanding right, that was the mm-hmm. trade-off. And now mm-hmm. the hard question is, was it worth it? Yeah. So I'd like to say, and I think this is my heart, is taking up my cross and denying myself and following him has the deepest meaning that I've ever felt in my life, that there's a, a purity there, a, a, a truism that beats the practicing law, making money, pursuing this over here, pursuing the other thing. In fact, it even gives meaning to the other things of life. It's like, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be. It's like that kind of a that kind of a thought process for me, that it's, that intimacy with Jesus is where I find meaning in life. That's it. One of the things that I find for myself, and mm-hmm. as I wrestle with these same kind of thoughts, not mm-hmm. in the same, we don't have the same uh, journey, but I find that I wouldn't choose that path. Mm. And even again, yeah. But at the same time, I can say I'm glad I went down mm-hmm. a path. And I, I wonder if that resonates as a, and it may be that you would even be willing to choose the path knowing the intimacy. I don't know. I I, I, think, I struggle that I know myself, I'm a pain avoider. Yeah. And so any path that looks ultra painful, like you're mm-hmm. describing, if I'm going to be completely honest, I'm probably not going to choose that path. I'm going to choose the one of less pain even if it means more intimacy with God, I think if I'm honest, I'm, uh, I'm a, but I'm glad that God brought me down certain yeah. paths uh, in that as I look back, I'm glad to have done certain journeys. I wonder if that is a fair way of you representing you or do you have a different thoughts on this? Um, I'm a total coward. I mean, I was thinking about this the other day. I mean, and there's a journal entry that says, thank God he doesn't show me my future. Yes. <laughs> I thought about that. It's like, because I would have yeah. never have. Yeah. I mean, I thought I was done in 2005 with major surgery. Yeah. I thought I was finished. 19 years later, <laughs> I don't know if there's, I don't, I don't know if there's a medical end here. I'll I mean, make it a, be, a real simple, like if, yeah. if I knew that when I got out of bed, I was going to kick the dresser really hard and stub my toe and I was going to be yeah. jumping up and down, <laughs> the odds of me getting out of bed for the rest of the day would be close to zero yeah. because I would avoid yeah. kicking the dresser with my toe that hard and jumping up and down in that kind of pain. Yeah. That's just like, uh, so you're right. It's like, I would never want to know the future now. 
having stubbed my toe and had a, the experiences of the day, I would almost always go, okay, I'm, I can, I'm glad I got out of bed. And even though that was painful. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, yeah. I almost always will choose against going down the road sure. of pain if I know that. And in some ways, and in some ways you were presented with this later on because you've gone through enough major surgeries and you continue to show up at the hospital knowing mm-hmm. for the major surgery that you're going to have to go down that road. And, mm-hmm. um, but I don't think you're going for the purpose of thinking about it as, well, I'm going to get a little more intimacy with Jesus out of this. <laughs> it's, no. well, it's, it's survival. It's life and death. The reason why I'm willing to go to the surgery, even knowing that is if I don't do this, you know, I probably won't survive. And mm-hmm. if I'm guessing right, is that a fair yeah. reconciliation of uh, how you yeah. think about the world and that? That's yeah. the way I do. I'm just I mean, seeing, I, thinking I about, a, is this like a human relationship? And as I think about your journal and <laughs> what you've expressed here, I love the fact that you can see the good gift on the back yeah. side of this. And then I also cringe at the cost yeah. of that gift. Yeah. Two days ago, I was in the operating room. Here I am. And tomorrow yeah. I have to go to the oncologist's office. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hate that stuff. Yeah. You know? Um, but, yeah, I mean, I do, I do f- see and feel the, the impact it's had on my life. And I say, wow, that part is amazing. You know? Uh, I don't think, I mean, the the three things I've feared the most, I've experienced. You had to face all of them. All of them, yeah. So, But you wouldn't have faced them. God brought them right. into facing them. And in one sense, what I like about your journey is that your will chose to take the next step mm-hmm. over and over. And so there is a choice that you stepped into. In another sense, while we don't, understand there's a mystery there and yeah. why that's there. Remember, you, you write the mystery and then you you accept there's value on the backside too. I'm, I was in a recovery meeting once and I'm not v- violating anything with this, but the person basically said, I knew I had to turn left. I was at the crossroad, but I really wanted to turn right. Yes. And I started turning the wheel right. Well, I've turned left every time because I felt like I I had a responsibility to turn left to mm. to myself, to the Lord, to my children, to everything that I hold dear. I have a responsibility. And there could be a time at which turning left means stopping all medical stuff and saying, "Okay." Yeah. We're done. Yeah. But it, it isn't yet. I, I'm not there yet. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, th- that would have to be a decision that I make in concert with my family and with, of course, God directing me. But I understand when people get to the a very terminal place in their journeys and they say, okay, that's enough. I understand that. I have a belief that even if you were to turn right, mm-hmm. I mean, and I'll give the Jonah as a great example of that. Yeah. Even if you were to turn right, all yeah. it just means is that you're going to have a different experience of the dark night of the soul, the, yeah. the wall. And in that you're probably going to reconcile these very things. And yet there's something beautiful about, um, turning left and honoring God with your, your yes. And the two. So, so there's something there, but it's, one doesn't have to be overly discouraged if they see their life and they've made a lot of right terms when they were being told to turn left. I, yeah, I did um, radiation therapy for a two and a half inch tumor every day down in lower Manhattan. Yeah. About a two hour drive yes. there and back each day, right? Yes. For and the about, parking there is, yeah. actually, I don't know what, but that's it's like, like eight weeks or something yeah. every day, five days a week. But a different guy met, went with me almost every time. And what an experience, spending time. I would have never spent that time with these guys, these men. And then there was this little 
catering deli place that we would park at and I would run in, get the radiation done and run out. And at the end of the time, because we would get a sandwich and then eat it on the way back. This was so we could avoid parking and get in early and get back early as best we could. Yeah. But, um, and at the end of the radiation, they, the catering place threw me a party. Wow. And I gave them copies of my book. That is so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It would, but it was like the unexpected, like I look back and I smile, I feel warmth about how God turned that kind of yucky place into a place of warmth and connection, really, connection that I felt with the people going down, connection I felt with the with the caterer place. Purpose and purpose generally with yeah. when there's great purpose it yeah. means something to do with relationships and others. So Yeah. That's cool. No, that's um it's something just when you think about how you've written all this down and you've taken time to share what's going on in the journal that you find the purpose you find. I love the fact that you're wrestling and writing down great truths and then saying, and here's where I'm at today. Yeah. And your, your will chose to lean into those and you're sitting here today digesting that again. And you've gone through something really hard, but it didn't, it didn't take you to a place that you were seeking to go, but it took you to a place that you want to be. Yep. If that makes sense. It does make sense. Yeah. So when we pick it up again, I got entries on hope, a gratitude journal. Yeah. This will get interesting. So uh, we're, uh, we probably have two or three episodes left of uh, the journal, but um, I still feel grateful for you sharing your life and the more intimate parts of that and allowing me just to ask questions and yeah, Thanks, and Sean. dig in with Appreciate you and it. sharing that with the world. So yeah, thank you everyone for listening Blessings. again today and uh, we hope you have a great week.